Thank you very much. Like my Chinese uh, colleagues, I would like to thank Tony and Nicola for the invitation. And what a great uh, session this is, focusing on the impact that China is having on the global political economy. And what I would like to do is, uh, is shift gears a little bit uh, and look at the underlying physical reality that we're talking about uh, when, we when we discuss this uh, changing balance in the global political economy. So I'm talking about the impact that China has on the uh, material uh, resource and energy security of itself and of other uh, developing countries. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, leads one to discuss this question of green. So the, the approach that I'm going to take is that there is a green of the global economy underway, but it's not something to do with an idealistic goal, uh, a moral imperative. It's something to do with the economic imperatives, resource security and energy security that are actually driving China. That's, that's the core of the argument. So I'm, I'm going to be talking uh, to a book that will be coming out uh, later this year uh, on uh, called The Greening of Capitalism. And you can see the, uh, the, the cover design is a nice one. It's showing this great smog that we associate with China and the rise of East Asia. Uh, but there's a, a green, there's a green light on the hill there. There's something green <laughs> coming out of uh, this smog. And uh, just uh, to emphasize the perspective that I'm taking here, the perspective is that we're talking about a shift in energy and resources that derives from uh, China's enormous growth and its enormous impact on the world that it inherited, the world created by the West. But the, the, the kinds of policies and the practices that China has been developing are driven not by the moral imperatives that have become very popular in the West. They are the idea of zero growth, for example. Zero growth is a lovely idea, but of course, uh, in China, where it it's needs uh, seven to eight to nine percent growth every year, uh, zero growth is simply a non-starter. So we have to take a different perspective on what we mean by green. So green growth is essential, but it's an economic imperative, I'm arguing, for China not a moral imperative. And that's a very, very big difference. Uh, and so that's why I think we see uh, China uh, becoming the world champion of renewable energies. And who would have believed that? Uh, certainly, uh, certainly not Friends of the Earth, for example, who were promoting the idea of renewables a few years ago in the West. But now it's China that is the, the real champion behind uh, renewables. And again, I think we need to understand that as an economic imperative, as a source of energy security. So I, I have a, a, an argument, uh, and the argument is developed at length uh, in the book. And all I can do is flag some of the propositions in the argument this morning in this presentation. Uh, but uh, to give, you know, I, I, I very much appreciate the, the monetary and financial perspective that my colleagues have given. But hiding behind that, there is the material and physical and energy uh, perspectives uh, that I'm covering uh, in, these, uh, in these propositions. And what I can do this morning is, is very briefly uh, show the evidence that these propositions are based on. As a social scientist, I like to argue from evidence and then theorize on the basis of the evidence. Uh, well, these are the propositions, but I'll show you the evidence on which they're based. So it's basically that what we're witnessing is a world historical change, the diffusion of industrialization from the west to the east, and this diffusion is uh, uh, leading to uh, a rapid uh, expansion of the scale of industrial activities driven by China. And as that scale grows, uh, so the possibilities of meeting the energy needs and the resource needs of China and then all the other countries that are coming after China uh, simply is impossible to meet given the existing Western approach to industrialization using fossil fuels and virtually unlimited resources that are mined in the third world, move through the economies and then are dumped back in the third world. That model simply will not scale and that's basically the argument why we have to see a greening of the economy starting with China. 
So let me uh, dash through then some of the uh, evidence that uh, we see here. And first of all, this is the reason why China and so many other countries have their sights so clearly set on industrialization. Because industrialization works. This is what happened in Britain. And every country wants to replicate that experience of rapidly rising growth. And that growth and in income comes from manufacturing and the manufacturing is based on new energy systems. And in the case of Britain, they were energy systems based on coal. So coal was the game changer that enabled Britain to break out of the Malthusian trap that had linked uh, rising income to population growth and then to catastrophic curbs on population growth through war and famine. Britain broke out of that with this uh, rapid rise in income, and every country wants to replicate it, notwithstanding all the discussions that have taken place over the immiserization of the working class, etc., etc. The, the reality is that rising incomes are generated by manufacturing and industrialization. And what's happening with industrial, what's happening with manufacturing around the world, we've heard from, uh, from Jim yesterday, uh, this is uh, the OECD take on it, but again you see the share of the Western countries of uh, world uh, manufacturing value added declining. Those of the non-OECD economies for which read China and then India are rapidly rising, so that by the year 2020, clearly they will, over, they will cross over. And that will be when we move to a Sinocentric world, right? We didn't use that phrase yesterday, <laughs> uh, even though uh, Jim O'Neill was uh, hinting at it, but let's be quite uh, frank about it. It will be a Sinocentric world when those lines cross over. And of course, there's lots of other evidence uh, that is canvassed. Uh, here we see rising uh, GDP uh, per capita. Uh, so Japan was the first one that uh, caught up with the West, and Korea comes in the, in the, the blue line there. Uh, and you can see uh, China and India rapidly following uh, in a similar uh, direction. So clearly, the movement is on, uh, the shift uh, is underway, uh, and I want to discuss its material implications that complement the financial and monetary implications that my colleagues were discussing. So what is this engine that drives uh, the China uh, Industrial Revolution? Well, the engine is energy, and the energy is based on coal. And uh, here you see the rapid increase uh, in coal-fired power uh, that uh, has characterized the China economy. Uh, and uh, in particular, the rapid increase, the turning point that was in 2001. And what happened in 2001? Well, of course, China joined the WTO. So in a sense, China joined the world. And the world uh, was then encouraged to invest in China, and that's what they've been doing uh, to an extraordinary degree ever since. And just like all the other powers that industrialized prior to China, uh, it's been based on coal. And there you see the rapid increase in coal consumption just in the thermal uh, generating sector. The, uh, producing electric power uh, through burning coal. So that's one face of China's energy revolution. It's the black face, the coal face. And of course, that leads to terrible problems that everybody knows about, the black skies, the black rivers, uh, the black pollution everywhere. That's what is happening. To contrast with that, we see a green face in China that is much less widely recognized. Here we see China's uh, investments in wind power. So this is both investments in the manufacturing of wind turbines and then in the use of those turbines to build wind farms and grow the proportion of wind power that leads to the uh, energy economy and, and in particular the electric power sector. So doubling every year uh, and uh, becoming uh, the world leader in wind power in less than a decade. Now this is true energy industrial revolution that we are talking about here. Uh, it's phased off a little bit, uh, but uh, the, the, you, can see, uh, you can see the general trend there. So to summarize just on this, this part of the argument, is it possible for China to raise five or six billion people, or China leading the way for five or six billion people to increase their living standards to Western standards using the Western model of industrialization that involves fossil fuels and 
unlimited uh, resource uh, access, clearly it cannot work, it cannot scale. So something different has to be developed. And we interpret this in many ways in terms of uh, global warming, uh, in terms of uh, environmental spoliation, in terms of loss of water, loss of soil, problems with food. But they all come down in the end to energy security and resource security. And the West finds it difficult to lead in this transition because of what is called, uh, a lovely phrase, carbon locking. So the United States Congress are complete, uh, uh, completely prey to fossil fuel interests, the oil industry, the coal industry. But these BRICS countries, less carbon locking, more possibility of breaking out uh, and developing a new model of growth so here we see China going beyond and building the largest renewable energy system on the planet. It's not surprising when you think of the challenge that China faces. It's only surprising to people who are only familiar with the black face of China. So uh, can, uh, can, uh, this, inter can this uh, transformation uh, take place in time? Uh, that, of course, is the great unanswered question. We're basically looking at a huge uncontrolled experiment that involves the planet as a whole and we don't know what the outcome will be. They don't know in China. No, nobody really knows. Now here's the way to encapsulate the issues, not from the perspective of zero growth and the perspective of uh, uh, the moral imperative of greening the economy that is so common in the West, but this is the stark reality that faces China if it is to proceed in the business as usual pathway. This will be the gap between its uh, oil production and its oil consumption. So that gap is growing. Likewise with India, the gap seems larger, although the absolute numbers are smaller for the case of India. Now that's a chart. There's some statistics. But what do they mean? As this gap grows larger, it means that China will have to go out into the world with its oil companies and its other companies and look for oil contracts in Iran in Venezuela, in Somalia, in Nigeria. We know what's going on in these parts of the world. We know the, the reality of uh, a country like China building up its access to oil supplies to plug that gap. We know what they'll be. There will be war, revolution, and terror. And so the real implication of this chart is that China <coughs> is concerned to avoid the implications of the business as usual pathway, which are war, revolution, and terror, and to find an alternative pathway, because after all, the strategic goal of China is 50 years of peaceful development. 50 years of peaceful development. You won't get that by following a business as usual pathway and accentuating your reliance, your reliance on oil imports. So that's what is driving China, I believe, uh, to find an alternative pathway. And this too is, uh, is emphasizing uh, this, these bleak prospects. So there's a, a headline from the uh, Financial Times. China, the new gas guzzler, you know, becoming more dependent on oil imports. Clearly, from China's perspective, there has to be a different way. And from the OECD's point of view, uh, the pressures will only get worse because this is the growth in oil uh, consumption over the next two decades, according to the OECD. And you can see the, real OECD, the, the current OECD countries uh, are just a very slight increase, but all the increase focused on the, uh, China and India. So the, if they're going to go down this pathway, then they have to cope with these kinds of problems. Uh, getting the oil just gets harder and harder. So it's more dangerous, it's more expensive, it's more dirty. No wonder uh, BP had its problems with the deep horizon uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. That's, this is why uh, it's getting so harder and uh, getting so much harder and uh, why people are talking about peak oil and the dangers and the costs as we move over the peak and are moving on the downside of the peak oil. So how did it all happen? Why did the world get so dependent? on these fossil fuels and why are these uh, countries like China trying to move away? Well, this is what, uh, this was the contribution that General Motors made uh, to the welfare of the world. What they did was buy up public transport companies in city after city in the United States. 
uh, and uh, trolley bus companies. And what did they do? They shut them down. So they bought up the trolley bus company in Houston, Texas. That's why Houston, Texas has no public transport today. They bought it up in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has no public transport today because what did they do? They bought them up and they trashed the trolley cars. So that was General Motors' contribution. Uh, and that's why uh, we have a problem. That's what you call carbon locking. And that's what uh, China and the BRICS are trying to get away from. So what they're doing is developing a different approach, a different uh, kind of uh, energy system. And here we see the official uh, Chinese projections to the year 2020, when their electric power system uh, will be uh, rapidly greening and the renewable power sector will be growing. But it's already happening. And this is a chart that I think it's worth spending some time on because in a sense, this chart shows you where the world as a whole is going. These are the current renewable energy capacities of China, the US, Germany, and India. And look how the Chinese renewable energy existing capacity, hydro, wind, and solar, already dwarfs those of all the other powers. And the plans are, that the published plans, are that China will expand uh, to 2017, that is only three, three, three or four years away, uh, to 550 gigawatts. That is half a trillion watts of renewable power to be developed by China as its official uh, goal from the, announced by the National Development and Reform Commission. By which time, the US and Germany aren't growing at anything like that rate. So if China has 550 gigawatts by 2017, it will have over half the world's renewable capacity. Now that translates into technological leadership, it translates into leadership in uh, energy discussions, and it translates, and this is the convenient truth, it translates into lower carbon emissions. And I don't believe there's any other uh, viable, credible approach to reducing carbon emissions other than through building renewable energy systems in the way that China is doing. And what, uh, what drives that process is, of course, the rapidly falling costs. So here we see the costs declining in solar photovoltaics, and they're declining rapidly. Now, back in the 1980s, there were programs in the United States to ramp up the solar photovoltaic industry in order to drive down costs. And it was going to be ramped up by military contracts, exactly what uh, Professor Weiss was talking about yesterday, the role of the state in, that, uh, in the American economy uh, acting as the vehicle for driving down costs. What happened was that it, the program was abandoned. So back in the 1980s, the possibility of reducing the costs of solar photovoltaics was there, but it was abandoned in the, in the name of the lower prices of oil. Now it's coming down, and coming down rapidly. 2012 is further down on this curve. And who's driving it? It's China. And as those costs come down, so it becomes feasible for India and Brazil and South Africa and the other countries to develop renewable energy systems, to base their industrialization on the renewable energy systems, not on fossil fuels. Interestingly enough, the lower curve is second generation solar photovoltaics. And according to Schumpeterian technological dynamics, uh, you would expect second generation to uh, emerge as the leader through lower costs. But what happened was that uh, the Chinese firms were reducing their costs so fast that they actually got under the cost of the second generation producer. Never happened. Quite extraordinary development in industrial dynamics. <coughs> with very unfortunate results for companies like Kanaka and Solyndra in the United States. They went bankrupt, even though they had uh, big federal loan guarantees. Why did they go bankrupt? Because Chinese solar photovoltaics driven, were driving the costs down in the first generation. Okay, so what's happening around the world? There's a lot of investment in uh, renewables. It looks a lot around the kind of uh, levels that you were talking about, 250 billion a quarter of a trillion dollars per year in renewables. It sounds a lot, but uh, actually uh, we need far more than that if this transition is going to be successful. 
Uh, and according to the OECD, we have plenty more. These are institutional investors and the funds under management, and they uh, exceed $70 trillion. Now, those funds under management uh, exist. They are waiting to find good uh, projects to invest in, and the best projects would be those in the BRICS in infrastructure. So, you know, there's, that's the private sector. Uh, the BRICS bank would simply be uh, helping to catalyze those and uh, channel those uh, into the appropriate infrastructure investments. Now, I've spent quite a bit of time talking about energy security because it's the most immediate issue and uh, in many ways the most important, but resource security is just as important. And I've only got one slide on resource security, unfortunately, uh, although there are, there are many more that could be discussed. But what, uh, what China is developing as a national development model is a circular economy where resources are circulated. So as opposed to the linear model, you mine resources in Australia or South Africa or Brazil, you utilize them and then you dump the products. That's the linear model. The circular model is you keep circulating the resources by turning outputs into inputs. Outputs into inputs. That's the key idea of the circular economy. And this is just one example in China where a sugar, a sugar refinery moves into ethanol production uh, and then uh, some of the waste uh, is used to generate power and uh, then it's used as uh, the foundation of a pulp mill, a paper mill, uh, and then uh, cement and so on. Okay, so uh, resource security just as important. Uh, this is a big business opportunity. So here are some billionaires who've taken advantage of the opportunities, Elon Musk and the west coast of the United States, Wang Chuan Fu. BYD, the company that is the counterpart to uh, Tesla uh, in China. BYD stands for Bring Your Dream. <coughs> well, Bring Your Dreams to the Green Economy sounds to be uh, appropriate. And Masayoshi Son, uh, SoftBank in Japan, uh, a key uh, practitioner of Schumpeterian creative destruction. Now, the key idea that drives the transformation that I'm talking about, uh, the energy and the material transformation, is the use of finance. And so I just want to say a couple of words on finance as well, uh, but move off the public banks that have been discussed. Uh, the equivalent in the energy sector is the Global Climate Fund, uh, which was agreed uh, at uh, one of these uh, summits under the Kyoto Protocol. But uh, they've, uh, they've agreed to commit $100 billion to it, and, and you can see what the scale of investment required really is. Uh, but actually, although they've created an office and they've appointed a director, not one cent has been actually allocated to that fund. So clearly a different approach uh, is needed, uh, and that, uh, that means tapping into the real financial uh, drivers of capitalism, which are the bond markets and the equity markets. But the bond market in particular, which is very large, uh, and uh, you have uh, initiatives uh, like climate bond uh, financial instruments, which can be used now to uh, drive this transition. There are some examples from the uh, European Investment Bank, the World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, but a very important development was uh, back last year from the Korean Export Import Bank. The Kexim Bank uh, issued its own $500 million uh, climate bond or green bond. Uh, this was oversubscribed uh, and it, it's been uh, uh, certified by a third party, this uh, organization in Oslo. Uh, so this was a national development bank issuing a bond whose uh, resources would be channeled exclusively to green infrastructure projects. In this case, involving Korean firms uh, all around the world. Now, the bank that was uh, 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 contracted to, uh, to take this bond to the market was the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And six months after this, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, issued its own identical bank. Now, that's capitalist, capitalist emulation. That's competition working, uh, this time, in the sphere of green finance. So when you look at the world financial system and the global capitalist system, this is the best estimate you'll have of what it actually looks like. This is from McKinsey's. And you can see 225 trillion US dollars is the best estimate you're likely to get of the size, the scale of the global capitalist financial system. And if it takes $50 trillion to move the world energy and resource system from its current business as usual, unsustainable basis to uh, a new 
uh, green basis and use sustainable basis, then you can see it's already there, it's already uh, capable of, of handling such a transition. I'll skip it. Okay, so what is driving this transition is uh, the uh, threat of energy insecurity uh, that is part and parcel of the uh, business as usual pathway uh, that, uh, that China uh, is being induced to follow, but which is developing uh, a, different, uh, a different approach. And the key idea I want to leave with you on this point is that by focusing on renewables, China is making a very, very good bet because renewables are manufactured. So rather than being dependent on drilling or mining, pulling stuff out of the earth, with all of the geopolitical and environmental consequences of that, if you're, if you're building a system based on renewables, then that system is based on manufactured products. And we all know that China is very good at manufacturing. So it's a very good bet to build an energy system on renewables that use manufacturing industries to build devices that then tap into renewable sources of power. And China, being the great student of history, is learning very clearly from the prior examples of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan in developing latecomer strategies that actually lead to, in the end, leadership. So let me, uh, let me close then uh, by saying that uh, we, 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 are, we are in a new era. The age of renewables really has come. It's not just in the future. It's really here. It's changing uh, the world of energy. It's changing uh, the world of physical resources uh, and commodities. And some of the uh, alternatives that are being discussed, like uh, the carbon uh, economy, uh, you know, giving companies carbon credits for reductions in carbon emissions, these are just toys. They're just playthings on the margins of the real game, which is the rise of the renewable power industry, where you see China actually leading the way. Uh, so if capitalism created the problems, then in my view, it's capitalism that has to, fold, has to find the solution. And uh, I think the solutions are, are clearly there. Thank you.